Hi, Mage of the Podcast listeners. This is your host, Terry Robinson. And this episode, I have special guest Bob Batten. Bob Batten is one of the two members of Utility Muffin Labs and is probably best known for 25 years of Vampire the Masquerade. Is that safe to say? Oh, that's safe. Very, very safe. Probably one of the most popular World of Darkness podcasts. They do weekly book reviews, which are vastly funnier than the ones we do for Mage. And they have been trucking at it for well over two years. Utility Muffin Labs, go listen to their stuff. It's very well done. In addition to that, they have a Nerd Words podcast about things that aren't quite as tightly defined. But more important to the contents of our show is you've been running online, in person, and LARP Chronicles for ages, seemingly? Uh, It's ages. Well... At least for the online portion, we've been going just as long as 25 years of Vampire the Masquerade because we do it for our fans. So that's been two years for that. Um, But LARP, if you include that, eh, 25 years. The the whole concept of LARP to me is terrifying. It's my version of I have a friend of mine that refuses to get a Domino's Frequent Eater card because they're afraid of what that's going to say about them if they finally admit that they really like Domino's. (laughs) I I feel like to me that's going to be like my response to heroin or something like that where you're just never going to see me again. Like, where's Terry? He's at the great LARP in the sky now or something like that. So LARP is very rewarding. I can tell you that it's uh, if you've ever had a passion to act, that's what LARP is for. Yeah, but then you look at the Mage Facebook group, and it's a lot of Northern European programmers. I don't know if that quite fits fits the same oeuvre. There's a reason for that. But yeah. <laughs> uh, but as far as role-playing goes, what initially got you into role-playing, and what was your first system? What got me first into role-playing is, is Dungeons & Dragons, ironically. Um, it's something I'm not particularly uh, a major fan of, but I did enjoy when I was 10 years old, and my uncle let me play in his campaign. And straight up, I got to be a hero. It's, it's, like, it's like I went from being just self-aware to understanding that I can make a difference, right? Because when, you, when you're the hero, everything's grand, and you all have a purpose and a cause, and it feels great to accomplish stuff. And that's what I got to do with him. Then once that happened, it kind of, the bug bit me. We'll put it that way, and I was curious. So I went about and uh, got all the books I could and started reading just on mythologies. And um, if you can imagine a kid being in a library or so, my mom thought it was weird. I'm just going to put that on the table. I sat there and read uh, a shark book, right? Because that was my disguise. She knew I was into (laughs) into sharks and whatnot uh, because I had to sneak in the occult books, right? That's what I thought they were. I grabbed these Time Life Wizard and Witches book. I could distinctly remember it because I read there were witches in Dungeons and Dragons you could play. I didn't know what that was. So when I pulled it over, I started reading and I was like, this is pretty creepy. I don't know. Wow. Uh, Black cats can cause a curse and mischief. I don't don't understand what I'm reading. So I bring all this to my uncle. And what he tells me is I'm getting rid of all the D&D books. Oh, man. Shit got cereal. Right. I was like, why? He goes, it's too much. It's too much. You're just, you're just too much. There's other things to do. Go do it. And so I did. I did sports and whatnot. And lo and behold, I'm in a bookstore at about, oh, I want to say 12. And I walk in and I see the Shadowrun book, which was interesting because I didn't give up role play. It's just I had to find the right group. What, what era was this approximately? Oh, man. This is a... Uh, give or take four years. Give or take four years. Let's do that. We're talking, this is, uh, this is mid, mid 80s. Okay. Early 90s. Got it. It's, a, it's, it's around that time. Formatively, I was into horror films my whole life. That's my dad's influence. And we used to watch that stuff all the time. So a series of influences, we'll just call it that, because I could be here all day on that alone. And I end up finally making a decision. I got buying power. I do chores. I get money. I get to get a job soon, because they tell me about that. Since 12, I was told you'll be working next summer, always that. You got to understand down south, you can get jobs and not have to be 16. So that's what I was driving towards. But what do you buy when you're that age, Right. So the bookstore became my outlet. I get the Shadowrun book and this vampire book. And I thought I would have a book. My dad did not because my dad's a big reader. So I get the vampire book. I go home and I start reading it and I get to the rule section. I read all this stuff on vampires and their clans. And then I get to the rules. I'm like, huh? So I have a father moment like, uh, dear father, I am a moron. What are the rules for it? And he goes, well, son, you play Dungeons and Dragons. This is Dungeons and Dragons, but for vampires. And I said, yes. Yes, all day. This is going to happen. And uh, my first campaign building, I think, was that moment. I started storytelling before I was a player for Vampire. Just the urge to write and to to belong to do that. That's sort of the long-winded, that's how I got there to get the books and start buying and start going and start rolling with it. So was that first edition, second edition, something else in the... uh... First edition. Wow. So was that before the rose on the cover or was that on the first one too? I can't even... We, we reviewed that, too. It had the rose on the cover. It absolutely did. Okay. Uh, m- my first exposure to Vampire was walking into a game store, not having enough to buy enough Magic the Gathering booster packs as I wanted, and then going over to the 
the book section, seeing that beautiful green Marvel cover and just reading it cover to cover and being like, this is fascinating. I'm literally never going to play this. And then <laughs> fast forward three years at a Star Wars collectible card game tournament, grabbing the Mage of the Ascension cover and being like, man, I will try and play this. So it only took another seven years after that for me to actually run a Chronicle. But <laughs> do you think there's a different world where a different Bob plays a different system? Or do you think all Bobs would have eventually converged on Vampire? It's a given any Bob would converge on Vampire. But you got to understand what Bob is. Bob takes them all. Like if it's White Wolf, I'm playing it. Huh. That's that's what it is. I am I am White Wolf's unofficial whore when it comes to playing all that they have and being a part of it. I mean that term as dirty as it is. I've played their whole system, Human Occupied Landfill, to give you an idea. Interesting. That was the Black Dog Game Factory game that uh, was oh, supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. I just picture you going to like a black market dealer in the early 2000s when all the lines were suspended and being like, what you got, Mick? I'm, sus- I'm strung out. And he's like, all I got is some uh, some group books for Hunter. And you're like, hit me. And and that's how you get through another week. Um, I, was an, I was an oddity to a lot of people for one reason. I did, I did sports. Like I, it's like I had a dual life. If I went and I did football, I'd come home and suddenly I'm playing with a bunch of friends this dark game where we had cubes of Mountain Dew and all the snacks in the world because I was a uh, I'm not gonna say I was compelling, but I was or that I'm all that, but I was very charismatic to the group of friends that wanted I took them from D D. They played Dungeons and Dragons, I presented Vampire Vampire all day is what it became. And what they would do is we would go from Friday after work until Sunday morning, nonstop. That's absolutely terrifying. Like if I have to story tell for more than four hours, I, I usually have a panic it's, attack at, at like hour yes. three thirty. So uh, do you, do you have any other creative outlets for that pension for storytelling? Have you ever done uh, competitive storytelling or do you have any fiction under your belt or do you plan to, or is this pretty well your creative outlet? Here's, here's where I admit, um, I very much would love to write. Here's the downside of all the writing I've done. I've invariably let people read here and there. And I get nothing but encouragement, and then I don't continue writing, right? I don't, I don't want to share show anymore. This is a weird process. I could tell you why I do it. You read someone like Stephen King, and you're almost crushed with how they write a book, right? Like, it's just so well-known, and this is what people want, because that's who's in demand. I turned around, and I started reading what uh, passed for, like, the Iliad, right? Back in the day, how did that seem popular? How did that get so good? And what have you. And I noticed there was a defining line. No matter who the writer is... It is the audience that digests the material that determines what that's going to be. And I was crushed. I was crushed ever since. I had a view and a vision for how Bob sees horror films, how Bob wants to write about his type of vampire, get that out there. And as I write it, I sit there and go, all it takes is a, is a, is a critic at the wrong moment to get you to not want to share yourself. Because that's what it is. When you write, you do share yourself. Now, how do I view writing a book different from writing a game book? Game book's different. Game book comes with the, we're going to make adjustments. This is a work in progress. You have all the excuses in the world to protect your ego and to not be out there, but your ego is still involved, right? But you have outs. When you write a book, it's just you. There's no defense. And so the one place that I'm a coward in my life is the fact that if I have to push forward what I wrote and give it to someone, I have to watch that reaction on someone's face. And here's the trick. You're your hardest critic. So I haven't written something that's knocked me on my butt. So I'm not going to give something that doesn't impress me to anyone else to read. Although what I commonly get is, dude, this is amazing. Like we're all, it's just, it's all you get. Nah, I'm, I'm cool. It's a weird thing. Now, stupid question. When you storytell, do you knock yourself on your ass? Or is there something fundamental about that medium that makes you more comfortable with that? I just submitted a piece. I'm working on a Storyteller Vault supplement on literally randomly generating plots and I got editor's notes back and I got something in the neighborhood of 130 comments and the thing's only 15 pages long. So I, I haven't actually opened that email yet. I just saw the header that said edit count. So is there something about storytelling where you feel you're immune to that? When I storytell, I sit down with my player and it's it's cheating, right? When you write, you have to think up of the, the, the characters in the book, the story, those are going to drive the plot, what's going to happen to them. You control all of that. So you can make them look amazing however my brain goes what if somebody else in storytelling somebody else is coming to me they're making up the story for their character does their character fit into what i have and do do i accept the challenge of telling a story of their life in the world we agree on that's what storytelling is to me and if you could tell an entertaining story you thus keep that player and that's how it goes i haven't failed yet and like I've like right now, we have 120 people online. Uh, my live action game is 10 years of 100, 115 steady every Saturday in a LARP. That's a that's a crowd 
uh, every time you turn around. Just me. Occasionally, uh, I had Nate for a bit too, but off and on, you know, you get good people who love to act. Nate's one of those guys, so I'll never admit to it, but he's a phenomenal actor. And uh, when, he, when he gets in a role, you really want to see him go. And so that's my secret. You ask that question, I'll rewind it to simple. It's when I storytell, that player is my job to make them feel as cool as they need to, as they came here for, because in them feeling great, I will know I'm doing a good job with the story I'm telling. How collaborative do you consider your storytelling process to be? I mean, in D&D, let's put it on a spectrum, where on one end there's Dungeons and Dragons when it first came out, and it was Dungeon Master versus Player. If you didn't kill at least two of your players by the end of a chronicle or a session or something, they had won. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have something like, say, Fiasco, where there's not even a storyteller, where everyone's just trying to work together to make a good story. Where on that spectrum do you feel you try and act as a storyteller? You're a storyteller through the whole process, but you got to remember, it's thinking on your feet. That's what a storyteller does. I'm, I'm often remembered what word of mouth storytelling really is. It's where it comes from. It's that guy sitting, a professional storyteller, sit by a fire, ideally, or pick their, their battle where they're going to really tell their tale. And it's nonstop just them. Everyone looking at them as they go through a narrative of something cool. And they got to they gotta pick what that is. You got to know your audience, right? That's the key. If you know your audience, you know already what you're going to say. And thus, you're put at ease because you're not nervous. Now you can focus on delivering the story. That is where that collaboration has got to be. Okay, so to you, it is a process of being able to take the, I guess you could say, implicit feedback of the participants and are they enjoying themselves? What part are they diving into? And you feel it is your job to to weave a plot closer to that rather than maybe explicitly taking notes from a player who says, hey, I think it'd be really cool if this group went in this direction. What, what's interesting is is on that is I could say yes to it, but it's not really. Um, my players, when they, when they any player sits in front of me and they start talking about the game, I listen to what they say out of game and the retelling of that story that's theirs, right? It may be mine and when we tell it, and sure, I ran the game, but ultimately it belongs to all of us. I mean that in the spiritual sense that we were all there having a good time. So when they walk away talking about that awesome plot or what goes on, I listen to what they say about their character. I listen to what they say about the, the NPCs they encountered. The more detail, the more passionate, I know that was a good job. The more laissez-faire about it, I know I need to sharpen it up. It, it didn't have an impact. Is there a note-taking process you have for that? So as a storyteller, they're trying to do their first they're trying to do their first chronicle. They're not quite sure what's hitting. They're not quite sure what's missing. Were you always good enough that you could kind of read that reaction? Or was there an initial part where you literally did set downs with your group afterward and said, hey, what worked, what didn't? Or where would you like to see this go? Is there any advice you have to that person who we've gotten through character creation? We had the first one or two sessions. They've burned through their initial material and they're not quite sure where to go. If you don't know where to go and you're having trouble understanding what's happened with players, or where the next story should take you, I would just do a self-assessment. Are you having fun? That's really what it is. Whenever a storyteller runs out of story, it's because their fun is bleeding. Somewhere, they're being drawn elsewhere. Something else has stepped in to have their attention. It's not what they're doing. Now, it's two things you could do. Do, a, do an in-house assessment and say, was I really stumped or am I not trying? And then give a go. If you could write a story for the next game session, you still got more to go. But then decide right then, well, I do have more to go, but is my heart in it? That's the trouble with it. I am a very uh, passionate person, so my emotions very much dictate where I go with it, but I could translate that emotion through what I do, right? I'm not sitting here hysterical, you know, or nothing like that, but it's, it's that the story has to be all, and I want you all to enjoy it as much as you are here to be you. Now, when you're that first storyteller, because I could definitely, I still remember that first time I sucked. We'll put it, we'll put that there. And it, and it wasn't vampire. I want to let that know. I, I didn't know the rules well. I just didn't. And there were two people at the game who had, who had lived the rules, just digested. And I was just taking notes. And I had, had all these charts of how all the disciplines should work. And I had all these rules for all the subsystems like feeding and how to hunt and making perception rolls and all this nonsense. And there hit a point to where I had this, this notebook and I was so frustrated because I couldn't get past the notebook. It sat in front of me and just drained me, right? Because every time I looked up, there are my two judges, eight people at the table, two judges. And what was weird, those two people were having the most fun. Like I'm telling this story and it gets to them and they're having fun running around being deputies, figuring out who murdered who, what are they gonna do next? Uh, the the two year olds at the table were getting over the fact that they went to a concert and the guy on stage wanted to be with them at the time. It was Ricky Martin. Yes, that dates me. Uh, but that was the concert the characters went to. And I remember that. And I sat here looking at this book going, we've rolled dice 
maybe five times. I'm just saying that happens. Like, you know, they tell me what they want to do. I tell them the scenario. They say what they want to go do. And I was sitting here going, sure, that's, that's what happens. Yes, you're right. But this happens. And I noticed that that was my key. Whenever it was not cut and dry, whenever it was open-ended, everyone else had stuff to contribute. See how it goes? It's like a, it's like a mental trick. You know, if I ask you, can I have a drink of water? You're going to tell me yes or no. If I say something like, oh man, aren't you guys, are you thirsty? That gives me an opportunity to fill in something. Exactly. And what do I have to drink? What would you like? Bob, did you always like drinking? That's the trick. And so suddenly I realized the rules are really nothing. Like they're there to help you as a guide. So you don't have to go through all that. But once you start playing the game, once the train is left, everyone's there for the ride. And if you can keep it fun and entertaining, they don't care. It seems to be the case that as time goes on and Chronicles get further developed, they always tend to err towards a more rules light version of the game or something more narratively focused. Has that been your experience too? Or have you always been a kind of a, it seems like you're a comparatively rules light person until player on player conflict pops up. Oh, and that's, (laughs) I, I say this with no, no amount of shame. I think at heart, I want to tell you, I'm not a rules guy. I really think what it is, I know them so well that it seems I have the confidence to make it seem like I it's easy. I have always believed that the storytellers should know the rules inside and out so well that the players who don't have never played the game never have to worry about it. So you started this online chronicle for Vampire and you said there's a hundred and change people participating in it. You're effectively a medium sized company. You're running a plot that would give Charles Dickens a run for his money. How do you keep track of that many things? Or at, or at that scale do you stop being storyteller and you start being referee? You're still a storyteller. Um, I found that I have people who want to read, right? Because you could do text-based scenes. You can do story as well. But I'll give last night. Last night, I have a four-hour session of Vampire 5th Edition. And it was originally only supposed to be six people. We're up to 11. And in the room last night, because people can listen and not have to play, uh, we had about 18 to 20 people just listening for that length of time. Just wanted to hear what was going on. And for me... I'm a ham. I'm a big ham. I I drink attention. The more I get, and when I'm storytelling anyway, the more I get, the better I perform. I just, I'm just going to put on a show because I love it. And I want the players to all feel it and, and eat that energy because they're a part of it. And, and I had some of that last night. That's the secret, right? Once you, once you, once you have that with me, I'm, I'm gushing a bit, but the, <laughs> the, the point of it is, is that when you have that attention online, they remember it. And what they'll do is they'll turn around and tell everybody else when you're not in the, cause you can't be everywhere. Mm-hmm. And they're in chats, talking to folks, you know, on a message form or whatever. They tell their friends, these people come back and they want to play in or join or be a part of it. With that sense of theatricality, are you ever worried that players are not actually playing? They're just watching Bob? You could say that. And some of it, I think a good storyteller is a good entertainer. And so it's okay to come to see that storyteller. But ultimately, I trick them. Because I'm a teacher at heart. When you come to see the story time, I'm here so you can see the good in you. I want you to see your value, not just mine. And how do you try and flip that on people? It's actually easier than you think. We do preludes in Vampire now that I've always wanted to do. What's it's, a prelude for our audience? A, a prelude is when, great, I want to play, you come to me, I want to play Vampire. This is the clan. I read the rules. I read the clan book. Let's go. I'm playing this guy. If you're a storyteller and you've been in it long enough, you know, that person has no idea what it is to play that vampire. There's no way they could. There's a questionnaire in the book that everybody glosses over to get ideas for what they want to play, and then they try to jump in both feet. What a prelude does is it rewinds that clock back. You have the sheet of what they want to be. Now you have to tell them the story of the culture of that clan, talk of their embrace, maybe their first feeding, what they're drawn to play, and what are the high points of what they want to be in their background before they actually play that character. So it's just them and the storyteller telling the tale of this vampire they're playing. And it's, it's magical. And when you do that, is it is it spoken? Do you write it down? Is it some other medium? It's written down because uh, the way we do it online, we're adults. People have life. You're not going to have 11 hours to sit in front and do some sort of prelude. However, you do have the ability to send a message, leave it there, flag the storyteller when I have free time. And I'm on, I treat it like one of the 80 messages I get a day. And I go, oh, they're ready for the next part. Type out the part. Boom. Send it. Move on. Uh, what do you do on the back end to keep those 80 messages straight? Oh, that's uh, a lot of drinking. Um, I'm thinking of going to, to heroin, you know, just to relax. No, I'm joking. The, uh, uh, what's weird is, is the more story I get from players, the more, you know, questions and demands and the things they need. Th- again, that's that ham in me. I know they're engaged. I know they're here for a purpose. And I'm, I'm UML, right? I'm Utility Muffin Labs with Nate. We both hold it down. And I know I got to do this. I got to do my part. And as fans, I really do feel 
I owe it to them to not only walk the walk, but actually hopefully teach them something about themselves. Because a lot of people, when they play a, a role-playing game, they're looking for an escape of a type. Whether escape from boredom, or it's something bad in their life they're trying to get through, or it's it's just confidence a lot of times. They just don't know how, they don't know what a win is in life. They have, Or they haven't done something they felt to win. And then I identify that, and I'm relentless in doing so, and I help them get that win. I don't just give it to them. No, nothing earned that ever came easy was worth earning. It's as simple as that. But the challenges in front of them got to be takeable. You got to believe in them. You got to support them a bit. And eventually, you got to let them walk. And when they earn that first win, you're done. They will never turn back again. And they know what it feels like. And they know how to achieve it. And I could sit back and go, and I didn't help you. Bold face lie. But I say <laughs> it every time, just so it keeps that confidence where it needs to be on them. Now, I'm curious, based on your definition of this being somewhere between life-affirming and therapeutic, is donating to your Patreon something someone can do out of their HSA, or do they need a prescription? <laughs> uh, I leave that to Nate. Okay, um, that is got Nathan <laughs> Seaver at utilitymuffinlabs.com. That's okay. a good question for him. <laughs> Talk to your primary care physician before seeking. Okay. You do periodic chats with your supporters, and I got to participate in one. And one of the things you brought up was the modern phenomenon of, I can't remember the term of art you used for it, but essentially sightseeing players of people just wanting to look at the world you created. And you had mentioned a few ways of drawing people into actually role play. And you thought that over time, that was something that became more and more necessary, that people were just kind of used to watching. What do you think a good way for a storyteller is to try and drag people in who are very much enjoying themselves, but are very much being passive about what's going on? To draw someone in off the sidelines is to give them that due attention. Somebody who's just watching usually has something to lose. They really like the character. They like interacting with the player crowd they have. And they don't want to risk rolling around with an NPC and losing it all. They also are starting to, well, maybe they just tune in to be, you know, it's a comfortable point in their life at the same time. But the community is where it's at. And you just have to go and talk to them, you know? I've, I've had people straight tell me, it's like, hey man, I have fun watching and my life's hella busy. And so I'm in the doctor's office catching up on those narratives you wrote or last night's scene. And oh man, I don't even know the first thing what to do with it. But you know, one day I'll have free time, I'll get back to it. And, I, and I've always chuckled. Because I when, when it happens, a lot of times it is the truth, right? I got no reason to, to say otherwise. Mm -hmm. But I go, tell you what, because the game's set up to where it's when you have time, not when I have time, I'm always here. It's when you have time. How about we do a scene where it's timeless? You start it, and as you get to it, we'll go back and forth, much like the prelude I mentioned. And then I get the real reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, it's usually something, man, I accepted this role and this position. I've been waiting to get this book and that book, and I really want to impress you. I want you to show I know what I do. And I'm like, oh, man, you're, you're, we're friends here. I just tell me you don't know. We'll work on it together. The storyteller title means I get the privilege of jumping and playing through you, right? So I get to be your Jiminy Cricket with fangs and sit back there and go, oh man, what are we gonna, how are we gonna handle this? Someone's gonna double cross you to get, you're gonna look bad in front of the prince, maybe, but if you took this merit, you have this too. What do you think that means? And you know, don't forget you have these lords to rely upon. Should we, should we research a little bit? Maybe find something else? And then they'll be like, no, 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 no. Because if we do that, this person, and then I just sit back and watch. Because as you jog their memory as to what they have in front of them and how that stuff can be, and you encourage them to read, but you don't demand it, you suddenly find a player who's more than competent at doing that. And the only problem then is getting them to not use you every day to have a think tank because you're, you're, you're busy. You want to be there when they're having trouble, but if it's just a normal day, hey, continue on. You don't need help unless you need it. You had mentioned your fondness for horror. Why vampire versus, say, Call of Cthulhu or even Wraith the Oblivion, who both have very horror-centric themes, but where at the end of the day you're something more or less a person? What what to you is the draw of vampire? Uh, to vampire, uh, let me, well, to answer it, Wraith the Oblivion I lost a girlfriend over. Um, I don't mean that uh... in, the, in the bad way. I mean that, well, it's always bad, but I mean, it, she was terrified. I'll explain this more so it doesn't make me seem creepy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the the effect is when we're running Wraith the Oblivion, you have a, a shadow ST, right? Some new, or, or the players partake of shadows and whatnot. We were doing a live action, so there's supposed to be a narrator who does just shadows. As often the case is, there's like 11 of us. So there's no shadow guy because you want everybody, many players as possible. So it was asked to me to be a player and not say anything and we'll run these shadow scenes later on but we had a unique way of doing it so if you had to run a shadow scene you would go to this box and what i mean by this box this guy had a cool setup to where the closet didn't have a door on it you would go and stand in the closet and you wouldn't know who walked up to start the scene they would walk up and knock on the box and you just you can only face forward 
and then they would begin talking and that's it and so that's but that would be the shadow right so when it became a necessary point to do that shadow scene that's what i would do i had too much fun with it that sounds like a special kind of terrifying did you know the person who was in the other side so in in my head i'm picturing this as two like side by side closets without doors or something like a confessional without a door where you go in and then someone op- occupies the box next to you and starts talking to you and only if you can identify their voice do you know who's shadow guiding yes and here's the thing <laughs> When they get in the box, they would say, all right, Bob, take it easy on me. And I, and I, would, I would start it by saying, and who says I'm Bob? <laughs> right? They can't see me. They can only hear my voice. And then I would just, it'd be dead silence. I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't make a sound. I would let that resonate. And then in their head, of course, they went, it's Bob. I know it's Bob. He's guy's guy, shadow guide. He's supposed to do it. Okay, cool. Um, let me do this. And then he would go, oh, man, you know, dude, before we do this, just how are you feeling today? What they're trying to do is relax. They're trying to build a link that makes them that they know it's okay. And I said, no, that's not happening. I shut that down immediately, right? I need that tension. I don't need them to relax. I need them to play that wraith. If you can guess it, there are some emotional moments that come from that. And when you're dealing with something like, I'll give the example without getting too detailed. I never know who's listening, but we'll just say it got to a point of suicide or not, nothing ever happened in our life like that. But you could talk about it. We've, you've everyone's seen films of how that impacts a family and her character became a wraith through suicide. And I sat there and role played the two children she had and her husband. And I was an asshole to pick the husband. It was an amateur hour move in my end. I never should have done it. And I totally played this guy. And I, I talked to her about how she abandoned me, about how I was left behind, how I dealt with that anger that her sister was always there for me. And, you know, we, nothing happened, you know, her sister had a husband, but the fact is, is that I always felt I made a mistake in choosing the one who committed suicide over her sister. And I, and I could have, uh, but I, I marshaled on our kids are doing well, but they don't even talk about you anymore. Um, it's what you always wanted. That's the type of stuff I was putting in her head. Well, how about that? Um, Wraith was always built as a system that made you a little bit uncomfortable. I feel like you missed the part where it's just a little bit. But for our audience, the whole idea behind the shadow is that when a, a person dies, if they have unfinished business, there's a chance that rather than going straight to oblivion or rebirth or transcendence, they will go through this intermediate process where they are in the underworld and they are followed around by a shadow. It is their dark force. It is the part of them, I I can't necessarily say even dark, it's the part of them that wants to just give in to oblivion. And that systematically is represented by another player at the table, usually just kind of either sending you texts or giving you bits of paper or maybe saying it out loud softly. These light narrations of all the things that you're doing wrong and all the things that you should give up on and all the spite and hatred and anger that have followed you around. And if you would like more information on this, listen to our Mage the Podcast episode on Mage Wraith crossovers for more information. So that's Wraith. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not absolving me in a sense of I think I was entertaining. I think I was creepy. I did my job. That's all I'm saying. Uh, but um, I didn't have to pick the material. That's where I, I kind of segued on it. Okay. Uh, so be careful of that. Know your audience again. The other side of the coin is Call of Cthulhu. I definitely resonate with that. I love it. People who play Call of Cthulhu, though, are, are used to a, a folkish type play. What I mean by that, yeah, everyone says this. You could die. You can go insane. Very few people experience this. Just the risk that that could happen playing the game with the Elder Gods and the Unseen Worlds and the Mysteries, that is that is something that we might lightheartedly step into, but ultimately, we won! Ha ha! I like props. I like people being attached. I like, I like horror, right? Horror is not horror if you're comfortable. It's just not. However, I, I develop a timeout system, right? And that's the moment a person's eyes got larger than, than saucers, I'd pause, right? And it, and it happens invariably. And, you know, I, it, a lot of people go, no, keep it going. That's the engine. No, 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 no. There's a point where the brain clicks up, like it's ramping an engine, and they're about to take it to the next level. And you just wait a second and change to another player. Call Cthulhu taught me the amount of time and pressure to put on someone to then go to someone else, because that's that's how that should go. So nobody loses it. And uh, that's that's great, except I, it dawned on me. I have to do so much in emotional watching and refereeing to do something like Wraith or do something like Call of Cthulhu, it's kind of dull, hmm. right? That's dull for me. I don't want to put these people through a psychotic episode, yet I'm very good at being able to do that through story and narrative. So let me 
let me back off a bit. There's got to be a game, you know, it's not. And it dawned on me. We play a game every Saturday. It's Vampire. Everybody goes at it and has fun. Why, though, is Vampire that way? The simple solution, and not to go deep into it, is because vampires are both sexy and haunting, but they are not chill your veins terrifying. It's, it's the right kind of creepy or the right amount of horror where you feel that Call of Cthulhu, if you're not regularly having those moments or Wraith, you're not regularly having those moments, you're kind of missing the point, as it were. Exactly. Okay. In the same way that if you're a vampire with humanity of nine and you go around uh, dealing with terrors from beyond reality, then, then you're probably missing the game. Dirty Secrets of the Black Hand. Um, <laughs> Now, to pivot a bit, you've you've done Vampire forever, and, and recently you've started doing more in Mage the Ascension. What made you say to yourself, hey, the next system I want to spend a lot of time with, or the next night folk for World of Darkness that I want to add in, are mages? Well, we hit this argument that we had in chat, and it's something that I, I snuck into. Uh, Discord didn't alert that I was coming in the party, or there were just too many to see me. And I listened to this taste great, less filling argument. Obfuscate too. Got it. Who's more evil? Well, yeah, uh, it was down. Who's more evil and scary? Is it the Nefandis or the Bali, right? Bali being a vampire clan of nefarious origins, basically. And the Nefandis owning the shop on what that is. And they asked me and I said, well, I guess it depends on what we're playing. I'll never run into a Nefandis, right? I can almost tell you hands down. It'll never happen. And I'm lying through my teeth. Uh, because I'd had, since the beginning of the game, a little something-something. It was always there, waiting for us to enter, waiting to enter us, as it said. And uh, it's Tales from the Dark Side, if you don't know, I'm a fan. But anyway, the uh, uh, the whole point was is that as I heard this discussion going on, and I'm being a little imp helping it go, I sat there and heard three or four players, well, if we were the mages that we know how to do, <laughs> we'd wreck shop. Challenge accepted. Mortal, a bullet and a cold can kill you. Yeah, you, you see where this goes, right? Mm-hmm. Now it's now it's what's better. And I sat back and said, well, we'll give them their day in the sun. Um, so it, was, it became a debate of who's worse, uh, whether it would be the Bali or the Nefandis, and, and they're, just, they're just going to town on it. I myself am sitting in chat, and I'm trying to, to figure it out, right? Um, uh, what I mean by figure it out, impishly, I want them to keep going because there was a grand time for an ST to take notes if they wanted to. However, I myself already had an idea of what's going on, because unbeknownst to them, there was a bit of Nefandis uh, that was about this chronicle already. Um, I believe as a storyteller, all available in the White Wolf tool chest is for me to build a world out of. And this is done on purpose. It's by design. If ever there is a time where I feel there is enough interest for people to play such and such character, there is stuff that they could do that still interacts with the story that doesn't overpower any one genre. And that's the delicate act is to not add them all at once. That's And I knew that. So I just had to see who had the confidence to play it, who had the passion to do it, and that's what you want. You want the people who really want to do it, who really feel it's, it's something that they can not only accomplish, but that they have to accomplish it. And you talk to them. You let them know what they have going on, and would you have more fun doing this? And I had about six volunteers, and that spawned the mage. Were you already familiar with the Mage the Ascension system at that point, or did this involve some homework on your behalf? It definitely involves some homework because the mage I'd played up to this point, I remember doing it to uh, to me passing on the game multiple times, to be honest. I was at a friend's house. He was running the mage, and I don't know if it was a storyteller. I don't know if it was me just because we were playing whenever I got off of work. But I would sit there. We'd start talking paradigms and philosophies and traditions and ranks. And she's doing a seeking, so listen for an hour and a half while so-and-so goes through this. I don't even know what a seeking is. I'm sitting in the corner, and I'm supposed to be playing a narcoleptic Akashic Brotherhood anyway, so I started role-playing the narcolepsy. <laughs> okay, so you pass out at the table. And uh, it's, it's embarrassing, right? So uh, they decided, hey, man, this might not be the game for you. I agreed. And I you know, nodded and stayed out of it. Well, now I have players who want to step up to the table, and I said, well, we're going to do this challenge. Either it was a storyteller or it's this system, and let's, and let's see what it is. Here's what I found. Little column A, little column B. Now I'll back this up. Systems for me up to this point, Call of Cthulhu would be the most complex. Completely alien, different rules entirely. Um, it's, it's the same horror feel, but you have to know psychological horror to really be able to do Call of Cthulhu some justice. Also love prop making. Prop making's king in that system. So that's, that's that. Why is, it, why is prop making so important? In Call of Cthulhu, if I tell you a nice big fancy description of touching something uh, that is eldritch and horrid 
and held or made by an alien's hands from beyond really does a poor job if I leave that just up to you to describe the first time, right? First time I might get away with it. Mm -hmm. If by the fifth time I'm describing it again, you, you treat it as just carte blanche. Yeah, of course. It's old. It's ancient. Scary. I get it. Let's move on. That's people adding words to their vocabulary that might not have been there before. I believe it was Alfred Hitchcock, uh, who I am a huge fan of, that said, if you show everybody everything, eventually they get it. They get used to it. Uh, hence his genius in Psycho, right? He didn't show you someone getting stabbed in the shower. He just showed you the woman screaming in the shower, a knife falling in someone's hands as if they're to stab, and then you see the blood in the drain. But your mind fills in all the gaps. And that never gets old. You will always be able to scare yourself more readily than anything anyone tells you. That's great, but a prop does way more. A prop gives ownership of that horror. If I tell you there's an ancient book that you've discovered, and I put said notebook on the table. Now, because I only did notebooks, I didn't get smart on how to create like aged tea leaf in the oven thing. <laughs> yep. It was just, here's my notebook. And on the inside, I had a cutout Xerox picture of what the book looked like that they're holding. Mm -hmm. But I was smart. At the end, I said, this is a reconstructed, right? Meaning that the author had touched this book and put parts of that original book in this notebook. So, as, so, so right there, I made it acceptable. I told them, the reason why this is shitty is not only because Bob can't construct it, but because the author couldn't either, right? So it took me out of it. And now they have this creepy horror-filled diary of what this guy discovered about this book and they're holding it. And naturally at the end, something nasty because they read the whole thing, right? They know it's coming. I'm just curious. So you, you've introduced this. Has that prop making carried all over to the horror themes of vampire? Or is it just the fact that humans encountering the alien is so core to Cthulhu in a way that maybe it's not with vampire in terms of objects that that's not so important? Do you wind up making props for your other campaigns now? No. And the reason being is that's a hallmark of Call of Cthulhu for me. Okay. And in Vampire, there's something like you said this, uh, the, you know, the hundred plus books are out for Vampire the Masquerade. What could I possibly make that a fan of Vampire wouldn't know what it looks like when I told them? I could tell you book a nod, they're going to grab it off the shelf. You know, I mean, they, they've done a good job already of making props for their own everything. And to that end, Cthulhu does as well. But Cthulhu also has workshops at schools, and there's even a guild I ran into uh, that you can find online that'll make props for you uh, if you want them to. And that's that was daunting, but I often found that that was better. And here's why it's better. In Cthulhu, you're a human discovering all this stuff. And yes, you could become something more, but that's later down the line hard to do. Vampire, you start off as not human. And because of that, that alien feel, that, that attention, we have to keep the focus of the monster on the monster player. So I don't know how many times you've had an eye of Hazamel at the table, but I like to think there are hundreds or thousands of those floating around in the world in jars and such. So <laughs> call out to favorite clan, the Ravnos. What was it like integrating mages in to a campaign? Do you feel it did? Is, is it just a case where it was a vampire chronicle with mages added in? Or do you feel the addition of a second supernatural group fundamentally changed things or maybe even just gave a second perspective on the existing themes of what your chronicle was? It's two part question or answer for me. And the first one is is I always felt Mage was a bit uh, a bit off its rocker in terms of what council fuels it moving forward. How do you tell people with that much power that they have to answer to anyone of rank for any given reason? You know, if it's my will makes it possible and I discovered how to do it, who's this guy to tell me otherwise? I mean, he did the same thing. That's how he formed his organization. And that's that's a keys to power debate. Now, I said I'm not gonna do that, right? I don't need to focus on that. I'm sure you could do a huge chronicle of mage where tradition social things happen and whatnot and i was like i'm not going to do that because for the players i want to make this as simple as possible and i also and, and i take that back not simple focus different i want it to be a cabal and i want a cabal that's invited in and i want them to be invited in to do something plot effective don't know if you notice know about mage but they don't need any help in getting involved in calamity no they're we're pretty good at breaking just about everything Right. They'll, they'll do it. A bored mage is a dangerous thing. It's like a bored demigod. They're going to find a way to piss off Zeus, right? And uh, that's in, uh, by Zeus, I mean paradox. But the, uh, the effect I had here is that I brought him in and I said to myself, here's a guy that came in and he's an eccentric billionaire that admittedly is selling off an estate in the States that three of them coming in knows because he's escaping litigation. The, the police, for whatever reason, want him for something. And there's a whole set of bodies that this guy has allegedly tied to him, not tied to him. 
and there's a slew of theft that is around the world that has happened and he's now selling off his estate and we secretly got an invite and the cost is a tremendous but strangely none of the majors were, were millionaires at all like this guy wants money for it but why did we get the invite that's the whole crux of how i got him in and why i needed that is because initially i left it up to an npc story and i wrote this entire story out from the from the npc mage perspective of the tradition they played and this guy trying to basically convince people who can tell if you're lying and the moment you're lying what's going on how i wrote the story was that this guy was very convincing because he knew what he was dealing with he didn't try to lie to them he also omitted a lot he just didn't tell them about things and let them come to assumptions on the original narrative i wrote they end up walking away with two or three books that no one should ever have in their hands as a human being the guy wanted him to have them, but if he had to just leave he was going to sell them off but then that puts very troubling power in the hands of these mages because they're going to want and i was relying on it i knew these mages would want to read and know more and that's why i said i want players here to make this choice i feel this would be a lot of fun to put in their hands and for them to do it and to deal with what comes from it little consequence reward hunting thing going on and that's gonna be fantastic what i found is if you take six mages all walks of life and you have them come together and you have this great idea to form together my plan as I narrate, wrote already, and I was thinking might happen, the other Bob, as I like to call him, is my most hated critic. I can't stand him. He says to me, you know, Bob, they're not going to do it. Any plan you have as an ST that you've ever written down in a book that anyone does is the opposite of what is going to occur. And I said to myself, no, not this time. Was this, sorry, just is this feeling unique to Mage or is this something you get whenever you're running a Chronicle? That's anybody. Okay. That's any storyteller I've ever heard storytell has said, if I write it down, well, if you don't believe in the plot hammer, I don't believe in plot hammering anybody. And, you know, I guess it's it's caveat in tour when it comes to that regard. Some people do. You know, there's D&D modules that teach you to, you know, this is how you get them to actually go this. I said it before. If your storyteller knows the world well, and they should, they live in it, then the world of darkness is something they've accepted and they have their version of it and they've invited them into it. So anything that these guests do, you should have a reaction to because you are the world, you know it. That has to be a must. So therefore, I don't need a plot hammer because sometimes plots suck, right? You think it's the greatest thing you ever wrote down and not to them, they have no interest in it. What I got was a mixed bag. I got them, they're interested, they wanted to check it out, but then fear became a reality. A fear of themselves and what they could do and a fear of uh, the actual guy they had to talk to. There no trust whatsoever, nor should you, right? It's a very odd guy, coupled uh, with the effect of what they could possibly do when we're learning about themselves. Is there a contrast then between the horror that is often apparent in a vampire chronicle and the horror that becomes apparent when you start introducing mages? It, it, it seems like the notion of the beast is, is very straightforward in vampire, how you constantly have that bad side of you that is there, but is also you at the same time. Mage doesn't necessarily have an analog, but to cancel it out... You're, you're fragile, as you mentioned earlier, like mages die a lot. So I, I never understand these mages versus X uh, questions because like a guy can kill a mage with a gun easily, anytime. <laughs> Did it, when you were trying to blend the two, was there a, a power difficulty there or was there ever a case where you're like, okay, vamps, we need to protect these meat sacks. Were, were there any moments of either comedy or terror that came from trying to jam these two, two kids together? What I enjoy about it is that they've encountered vampires a couple times. They just never knew it. Hmm. Okay. They had, they weren't even suspicious to it because what I do is I have a whole player database of characters. And I know where they are all over the game, where the Haven, where they're at, where they're most likely to feed. That's vampire side. When the mages are introduced to it, I know where their Chantry is, where their cabal hangs out, what they got to go do during the day. Ironically, during the day, you'll never encounter a vampire. It's just not going to happen. However, when it was night and the one time they did go to a dinner, there were four vampires sitting in a room having a conversation in the far back, but none of them radiate or scream, hi, I'm in human monsters sitting in the corner. They didn't care. I described them. They went right past it. I said, that's a real reaction. It's exactly how that should. Be. So to there, there's, there's no conflict, right? It depends on how you depict it, what their senses are actually focused on and what they're going to, to witness and see. Now, as I told them, I do believe this. Coolest thing that got me in a mage was the aspect that if you tell me I control the keys to the universe, little phrasing from the order of Hermes, I control them. My will shapes reality. That is what I do. Then it becomes very dangerous for me to want something, right? That's a, that's a very, that's a heavy burden to place on someone. Suddenly I could do whatever I want and the consequences might be there, 
but I still achieved what I set out to do. Be very careful what you say to me. And that becomes a thing, right? Am I a monster or am I here to help? How do you feel that's fundamentally different, though, from vampire? A lot of the internal fiction within vampire talks about how they are a thing above humanity. And Mage follows a very similar narrative, but what do you think sets that apart? Is it just the the breadth of the power or the feeling of uniqueness or a sense of entitlement? It, it always struck me as odd that the theme of Mage is hubris, but the theme of vampire could easily be hubris until someone is struck down by an elder that kills them or a werewolf decides to tangle with the wrong umbral entity or again a changeling picks a fight with the wrong she it seems like that boast and that pride can apply anywhere what do you feel if anything makes mage unique in their ability to pursue what they want a mage is immortal like you could say they're immortal or whatever their power is infinite great they have an avatar yet reference the bullet comment we've been poking at the facet of that is is well how do i not have to worry about a bullet i could make it so i don't have to worry about it that's true and you start in a very dangerous path i'm looking to become immortal through magic which is the only way to do it i don't want to die and there's gotta be a way to do it many mage has want to do that you can be one but here's the torture do you want to outlive your family your loved ones your life are you willing to walk away from everything that made living worth living in order to take care of some fear of death that you have and what mage does that's unique is the fact that you're a human the player is a human and can understand that they're not alien of thought it's them right this awakening this avatar in them is and even their paradigm those those matter to them because that's how they identify with the power they have like to me the reason why your paradigm uh, becomes something that that is who you are but the tools you use to, to cast your magic becomes less and less needed is because you begin accepting what you are right it's very, if I were to tell you right now at the end of this podcast, you're able to now go do whatever you wanted to in your life, you're going to be wanting to like carry a, a keyboard with you or maybe a mic because that's where you first encountered your power. It's like baby steps. It's like your mind wants to have something that lets you know you can do it still. Like maybe if you didn't have it, you couldn't do it. But eventually you get used to it. Eventually you understand that those are just, those are just tools and you're going to leave them behind because you're more than capable to handle it on your own. That confidence is there. But also, so too go the stakes. Well, now that I don't need that, what else am I realizing I can do with my magic that I no longer need? Do I no longer need love? Because I realize with the mind sphere, the insights into the minds of the, the women and men that I do could feel a love for? Or do I, am I able to understand what that love is now because I see both sides? And do I, it's just a chemical, right? These thoughts become complex and that's the danger. Do you want that to be answered? Or are you happy in ignorance? Ignorance can be a bliss. And mages get all that. That's what they have to deal with. They don't have a force inside them like vampire that wants blood, you know, that's pushing them, that gives them the excuse to be that, that dark. Mage, you don't have that excuse. It's just you. So is it safe to say that part of the intimacy of the questions of Mage comes from the fact that you're playing something not unlike yourself, except for this one switches flip that says sphere magic exists, as opposed to having to deal with a beast and and whatever vampiric society looks like and all the constraints that come with that? Is there a sense that it's so much like you? And do you feel that is where that, that closeness in terms of uh, themes of horror and power and concern and love come from? Yes, I think we all have, nobody has a perfect life. And I think when you play mage, for the players I've seen, oh, let me say this, when I story tell for mage players, the characters I've seen and they came at me with seem to be facets that they wanted to be in control of in their life. Whether it was power over all knowledge or power over uh, the spirits you couldn't see, the ability to let go and relax or to have an easy way to, to handle foes because you weren't strong enough. This, these were all elements I'm seeing happen through the players in some capacity. So I sat there and said, okay, we'll tell a story where they, they, they could do something with that if they choose to, only to find the ultimate fear was what would happen if they did. The emotional equivalent of the, uh, the dog that caught the car. Exactly. Huh. It's, it's perfect how you put it. Why do you think Mage isn't necessarily, quote unquote, as sexy as Vampire? Is it just the, uh, the lack of culture surrounding it, making it look sexy? What it is, is Vampire, you have to go all the way back to Bram Stoker's Dracula, which really put it on the map uh, in a lot of ways, especially for the new generation. Um, folks, fans of Bela Lugosi, like myself, he's always going to have a, a place, right? Um, the, one, of the, one of the greats. But when you get to the portrayal of Dracula in Bram Stoker's, you see love eternal. That's driven into you. And you see a guy, at least according to their movie they put up, 
tells a very different tale of what that vampire is. As dark as he was, as powerful as Dracula was, as evil as he was, his entire existence was snuffed out because of a love he had thought he lost and he had condemned God for it. And in the end was forgiven, which is why he allowed himself to be killed. And when you think of that, very romantic. It's very gothic, right? It's very much an element that everybody kind of likes. Like you can't say, you know, uh, Ma and Jed can say, yeah, we loved each other for years. And we met out here in the fields. We're going to die out here in the fields. Do right by our kids. That's great. That's apple pie. That's simple. Everybody knows that you'll have that in life eventually. You settle, you'll have it. Happiness is there. Not saying it's not happy. But when you're young enough and when you still daydream a bit, everybody wants to be this cool, sleek, powerful, free, in control, dominant, predatory, just slick lover, right? Just something that I see it, I want it, my confidence is perfect, I go and take it no matter what. And then they believe I feel deeper too. If I have all these things, I'm looking for the right one and I can have anyone, but it's only going to be the right one I take into eternity with me because love is forever. That's exactly why it's there. And everybody gets that trope that plays vampire. It's just whether or not they explore it. Hmm. And Merlin's not exactly sexy. Oh, and that's where I say people can get it all wrong. Here's the thing. If I told you, I can make you immortal. You got to suck on blood. Uh, you're going to smell like the grave a little bit. It's where you got to sleep, got to hide from the day. And, uh, but you're going to be rich and all that and everything, but you might need an occasional friend once a century. I could do that. Or just as you are now, you want to lose weight? No problem. It's a thought. It's literally a thought. I just make it a spell, write it down, hand it to you, boom, you're that. That's easy. I'll give it to you as a freebie. I'm also going to let you open one of three doors down the hall. Open up the first one. You're just a rich guy, right? Go and be rich. No problem. High five. I just get half of what you have. You go to the second one. High five, you're rich, great, but, but nobody could, no blade, weapon, anywhere could ever hurt you again. You're physically and fundamentally impervious. That's what it is, but I'd have to take 20 years off your lifespan. Well, what's in the third door? Third door, you get to be me, right? That's, that's what mage does. And to me, that's a sexy concept. It's yeah, it's power. Let's talk about power to have, give you some sexy woman love life. Yeah, sure. That's easy. You can get that by being the richest guy ever. You really can. You can sure have fun. You still die. I don't know how good it is for you. You still got to use the bathroom, so congratulations. Second one, well, now you kick ass. No one can ever hurt you. You're super stud, and you got some money. Third one, you get to be me. Who do you think's granting you all this stuff? But I'm not telling you what I can do entirely, and you don't know what the drawback is. And what we don't have as a human being, we always covet, and we always want. So I'm a storyteller, and I want to sit down, and I want to do my first mage chronicle is that the theme that you feel that people should kind of instinctively bear down on the nature of want wish fulfillment and acquisition and maybe how hollow it is or is there some other recommended starting point you have for that first time mage storyteller first time mage storyteller i would sit down and make a character and that character should be your first cabal mate for everybody else and you should have that book and spend whatever days it takes for you to go what would drive you what do you want Don't even think of a story. Build the character. Be the player. Read the spheres. See what they could do. And I want you to be open-minded. If you need to, I did this. I put pros and cons of being a master of sphere, any, right? Went through all of them. And I found that they were terrifying, completely. To put in my hands the ability to do the things that those spheres let you do simply gave me a paralysis of power. I wanted to focus more on abilities to be able to do anything mundane before I had to rely on that power. Because once I start, con- this is Bob though. Once I start conquesting, I won't stop because you all are children and you don't even know it because you're a sleeper. So as the adult, I have to guide you forward knowing that what you're doing is hubris. It's wrong to think that you're powerful. I don't care what nation you are. I could show you a world and, and you will understand. And you can make of this land a heaven or a hell, but I'm your guide to show you that. And when I made, and that's what I did. When I made that first character, I was like, man, that's, uh, no, I'm not going to play him. I'm going to focus on the player. I could get lost in running a a mage game for just one mage. Did you run into any sort of power balance difficulties then at that point? Like, are there any modifications you feel you made to the system? Like focuses are particularly onerous or spells aren't maybe quite as potent? Or do you just feel that the, as a storyteller, you take care of those things as they emerge? You take care of them as they emerge. I find Mage, the especially the 20th and 20, has so many rules, so many things to remember, so many statistics, data, everything to get right, that you should throw most of it out. It should literally be on a research-to-research basis because if you know your story, you know what Mage is, you know what they're playing, you know the spheres, you know how to cast that magic, you know the consequences of that magic in a paradox sense, 
you have the gist of it. Everything else, research-based, but it won't get in the way of you running your game. I'm a fan of the corporate parking lot, right? It's, uh, you know, if, if you don't know, for those listening, if you're having a corporate meeting and they have this stoplight up on a, on a piece of scratch paper and they're telling you, I'm going to deliver this training course and if you have any questions, raise your hand. All questions will get answered. However, if you ask a question I can't answer immediately, I'm going to parking lot it. And we'll do a circle back and we'll get back to that parking lot. And I'll find that question for you if I don't know it immediately. Do a little research and I'll get back to you. And naturally, everybody agrees to it. Because, you know, hey, that's fair. Not not everybody's going to remember everything. Do the same thing. Same thing in Mage works like a charm. Do you have any other hints for first-time Mage storytellers or first-time World of Darkness storytellers that you feel could save a lot of suffering? It's tough. Uh, there's, there's a ton of tips. Uh, the number one I'll give you is I tell anyone, have confidence. What will destroy your game worse than anything else if you show these wild animals that we call players that you don't have confidence in your story, you will lose them. It's, it's as simple as that. If you come in and say something like, and how, how does that look? You go to describe a scene and a player know it all just knows all the rules to be able to snowball your prince in five minutes or in mage sense. Um, they cast this big old fireball, but knew all these tips and tricks, how to whittle down paradox to nil, but and it smokes a city block in the process. And you really didn't plan on that power level. All manuspheres are off, whatever. Don't show shock. Don't flip out. Don't do anything, but all right, that's what you do and start thinking of the consequences that happen because of it and make them real real consequences don't don't give something like he threw the fireball so merlin shows up and condemns him with a staff you'll lose everybody when you do that because that's just come on you know it's might as well be the story tour where you just stood up tore up a sheet of paper and told him to leave you always got to make it to where no matter what happens the player might get in trouble but there is an element and a way for them to get out of it but they've made their own puzzle that fireball thrower has to figure out why is it bad that a neighborhood is freaking out trying to put out the fire now that there are people trapped in a burning building that there are cops on the way. There are folks who saw him do it. Someone took his picture. And, you know, they're, they're, his, he's going to be known. And then you have other players that's going to get to a mage council somewhere. There, there's, is there a mage council? Of course there is. Should somebody come? Yeah, absolutely. His tradition demands it. That's You cannot do that. Not to mention, he starts feeling a tingling like he's getting warmer throughout his whole body because of the paradox he did. And he says, wait a minute. I would have lived down to only one paradox. It's like, yep, you sure did. But to do that, um, did you notice X flaw? Did you notice this flaw? Or I'm adding a flaw to your sheet because you didn't plan on this, but these 12 different shortcuts you took did. Where's that in the book? And don't answer the question. That's confidence. When you stonewall a player by not answering every pedantic question they ask, because that's going to court, I call that. What you're doing is telling them, this is a story. I allowed you to do what you wanted, but there are consequences for what you did. They're commensurate. Now there's a way out of it. You will have to clean up your mess. This is all fun though. If this is now not fun for you, please remember going forward, don't be the one to throw that fireball. And is that something you feel that one or two times most people figure it out or decide that maybe this game isn't for them? The first time it happens, it won't happen again. No, I was just saying, it's a guarantee of that. Do you feel that Mage should have a humanity system at all? I thought that my first time. It's like, where's the where's the consequence? But you know what we just talked about, right? Um, when you start thinking of that person who threw that fireball, you really start preying on the conscience of that player. They could say all they want to. My guy's ruthless. I'm your Thanatos. I'm just ending people. Turn them to the cycle. Is is that what it is? Yeah, you remember what Jor is, right? You like a lot of it? Would you like a jar of Jor? Because basically that's what you have now. That's quite a few people you just smoked that weren't ready for the cycle, pal. And, you know, let's 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 do that. And, and me, I'm, I'm riffing on it. But ultimately, in a storytelling facet, I would never do that. I wouldn't even tell them anything was wrong with what they did. What I would do is ask them what they're doing next. And by not reacting, literally, they'll they'll talk themselves up into a paranoia because they know they did something wrong fundamentally. Not really. It's a game. They want to do it. They did it. They had the reasons. But now they have to justify. Remember, their worst critic is going to be themselves. They have to justify to them how that helped them to accomplish their goal and move forward and why that's worse than having humanity. Humanity, I get a warning. If I'm about... I'm starving. I'm hungry. I shouldn't go into that club tonight with all the food because I'm going to just eat somebody. I know I'm not going to wait. I'm going to rip out their throat and do whatever, man. I need to. All right, let's, let's stop by the cattle yard. Let's get some animal blood. Let's take the edge off. Let's do something. So it could be approachable. I could, I could pre prep that. Think it through in mage. If a mob boss comes up to me and tells me, I don't know what you did to help my friend get out of jail, but now I have a list of people you're going to help get out of jail. And if you don't, your ma says hi, who lives at this address. 
It's now on you as you sit there and think, you sleeper. <laughs> I could snap my finger and you wouldn't even remember who you were. And and you got to think, this guy who walked up is just a mob boss. But then you got to think to yourself, if I start this process, why would I ever stop? Absolute power would be my goal at that point. So it very much sounds like then that you feel that given that a storyteller is willing to make sure that actions have consequences, not having a humanity rating as a thermometer, as it were, is worse because you have no active awareness of how hot the water you're in is. Exactly. And it's going to get exciting being able to do whatever, right? Huh. Thank you for all the fantastic storyteller tips and your experience with Maid so far. If people want to follow along this chronicle and see the story you're telling, is there a public facing way in which our listeners can do that? Yes and no. Now, I say that because uh, obviously listen to our podcast, utilitymuffinlabs.com. We'll, we'll lead you right to them. Um, you can hear them there. And that's a, that's a start. Why I recommend that is because Nate and I do talk a bunch about vampire, but there's other stuff too thrown in because you know people ask, we meet that demand. But the idea behind this is you get an idea of us, right? You get an idea of the storyteller first before you see what they're doing. And then uh, it's a simple matter of signing up to Discord and uh, hitting us up. Uh, we're not hidden, you know, utility muffin lads dash uh, curse of cane and just saying, Hey, I'd like to like to see what's going on and what have you. And our podcast will direct you through a, a better link than my, my mouth vomit there. Be able to check it out there too and get it. But once you're there, you just tell us is, Hey, Bob, I heard what you said. I'm interested in watching what you're doing with the vamp- vampire side of things. Um, is there any way I could listen in on a mage game and, and kind of see what's going on? And then the staff will work with you to get that set up. It feels so weird to hear you say the term and the staff. I say congratulations to your ability to take your hobby and your passion to something where you get to utter that phrase. I fully recognize that's not because you have like a quarter million in payroll that you're dishing out each year, but it is a uh, a testament to your abilities in the system that you can have a, a thriving community of this scale. Are, are there any other projects or, or things in process that you'd like to promote to our audience? Get used to seeing us, not to, or not just listening to us. We're steadily striving towards our next milestone, which is being on YouTube. Uh, that ability is so you can see us. Me and Nate are very expressive people. We always do video chat uh, when we have to record so we can actually see the truth on our, fa- on our face sometimes with the uh, comments that are made. And uh, that I think everybody would enjoy. Um, also, it gives us a chance, not just YouTube, but in, when we have guests or whatever inviting, you can see them too. So it's like when you do observe, it's like you're right there. And that is always a better feeling than just maybe just listening to us. And I have literally never played Vampire the Masquerade, but I have still found the show endlessly useful just to pick up plot ideas, insights into how characters think, and all sorts of other things. So if you're a storyteller like me, and you have no plans necessarily on even using Vampire, it's still very good grist for the mill. This is the part where I point to the fact that I literally have every Scion book ever produced, another system I will never use that I find endlessly fascinating, that has given me more plot lines than I care to mention. Bob, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And if you're not already following us on Twitter, join us at at Mage the Podcast. Listen to our show further at MageThePodcast.com. Leave us a review on iTunes. We are now also available on Spotify. Mage strong. Mage out.